this week as we come to communion, we want to be aware of the role that the blood played at Passover. Tomorrow, the Monday, the 22nd is Passover. And so we want to reflect on that for just a minute. And I'm going to read from Exodus 12. It said, On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both of people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be the sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you, and I will strike Egypt. And so let's consider as we take this representation of the blood of Christ, that part of the Passover, the, the, the whole thing of the Passover was that the death angel would pass over those houses where the blood was represented. And God had a certain way that he had told the Israelites, this is what I want you to do. Take the lamb, sacrifice it this way, eat it. It was interesting in the preceding verses, he says, eat this in haste, standing up with your robes on, ready to go. And this is what I'm asking you to do. And so as we consider the Passover and then we come to communion, we understand that the blood of Jesus is what the, the, the guilt, the sin, all of those things are taken care of because we are passed over in judgment because of that blood. And we're grateful to the Lord for that so that we can enter into his presence and be with him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's remember, take a moment just to remember and reflect on what it is that the Lord actually did for us. And let's take communion together. Welcome to River of Life Community Church. We hope you enjoy your time with us and experience God's presence. We will be meeting in our house churches next Sunday, April 28th. Our next midweek meal and service will be this Wednesday, April 24th. The meal will begin at 6 p.m. with the service to follow. Our next all together services at the building will be Sunday, May 5th and 12th. However, we will not be having a potluck after the service on the 12th due to it being Mother's Day. The men are meeting for prayer every Monday morning at 6.30 a.m. Please feel free to come and go as necessary. As we work towards making prayer the way we do business at ROL, we want to make sure in open times for you to join us in praying for God's will and timing about any possible changes in rhythm as well as discipleship opportunities. We welcome everyone interested in being part of this process to join us for prayer on Wednesday, May 8th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the building. Well, that's what's happening this week. Now let's prepare our hearts for the word. It's good to be back in house church today. Um, just a quick couple of update things in addition to the announcements. There's a lot of things that are happening in our church, and there are a lot of there's a lot of stuff coming up. So I want to make a few real quick announcements about things that are coming up and things that are changing. Uh, first of all, May 18th, Saturday, May 18th, there'll be a men's breakfast at nine o'clock. And we're going to have some table talk and discussion around the table. You'll have, there'll be more information about that. Second, we've been uh, in this transition. We haven't really done much about missions and missionaries. And then all of a sudden, supernaturally, there are many missions and missionaries that are abounding. And so this morning, you're going to hear from Scott and Deanna Miller, who have been missionaries to Jordan. They're back in the States. They're about ready to go back to Jordan. And uh, their message is really important for us to hear. It's important for us to be praying for our brothers in Muslim countries. And so I just wanted to let you know that, that Scott 
was the, he was actually the Chi Alpha president at Kent State before I was. So I've known Scott for 40 years. And the things that they're doing, pay attention to that, be attuned to the, the missions part of this. And we want to be involved in what God is doing, not just in our local, but also in our world. Uh, additional to that, Leave you and his family will be back sometime this week. Hopefully we'll see them at the third Wednesday meal. And if they are, then we're going to give him a chance to share as well. And Greg Shepler is back in town. And so he'll be preaching in one of the upcoming times. Also, May 5th, Randy Young will be coming and he'll be speaking about short-term missions and also doing the message. But there will be opportunities. Randy does a lot of stuff. He's been here before. He's been a friend of our church for a long time. And then one final thing on June 30th, it's a fifth Sunday and the council has made the decision that we are not going to meet. The church will not be sending out anything for that week. And so if you're looking to go, man, you know, I'd, I'd like to be out of town. When's a good week? Take that week. We're just going to take that whole week off. That'll be the week before the 4th of July and enjoy being together. If your house church wants to do a potluck, that's fine, but just be down. Lord, rest, be with your family, go do fun things. That's part of the rhythm, I think, that the Lord wants us to have. So thank you for uh, being with us today. And like I said, in this message from Scott and Deanna, I think you'll be interested to hear some of the things that are going on in Jordan, and we want to bless them. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Uh we're Scott and Deanna Miller, missionaries to Jordan, and uh, we consider it a privilege to be here with you this morning uh, on behalf of our family uh, and our daughters, Emma and Ava. We just want to say thank you for partnering with us over the many years that you have to support our work mm -hmm. in Jordan. We couldn't do it without you. Um, your prayers and your giving are making a difference, and hopefully, as we uh, share with you this morning, you'll be able to uh, connect the pieces and connect the dots to see how God has been using your prayers and your giving to help others and, and reaching the lost in the Muslim world of Jordan. So thank you. We deeply appreciate it. Um, we are a part of the Live Dead uh, initiative, which was started about, about 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it is an interdenominational, uh, multi-ethnic um, organization that is basically planting the church among the unreached in teams and going to places where there's little or no access to the gospel. And so we are sending and tra training and sending uh, many workers to go out into really difficult places. And Deanna will be sharing with you about that in just a minute. Um, but our role is that we serve on staff for a launch team in Amman, Jordan. And we have many responsibilities. One of those is that we help with field training. So we're training new workers that come to spend uh, two to three years on our launch team to learn language, culture, and how to do team life because we're sending these people to go out and to do team uh, life and ministry together in hard places. And so we are involved with field training. Deanna helps a lot with um, language and culture. Uh, we're also doing a lot of mentoring and discipling with our young team members. I would say the average age for um, our team members are probably 22 to 35, a lot of young families and couples as well. Um, and then another uh, part of our portfolio is that we're doing all the logistics and hosting for all of our short-term teams, which is around 10 a year. Um, and we would love River Life to send a team at some point. We'd love to have you. And if you're interested, yeah. we're the point people and uh, we would love to host you sometime. Um, another area of ministry for us is working with MBBs, Muslim background believers. These are Muslims that have decided to uh, walk away from Islam and uh, follow Jesus. And you'll be hearing some of those stories mm -hmm. uh, later throughout the message. And then the last thing that's something that God's really been birthing in us really for a long time, but really in a more official capacity over the last uh, about four years is that of member care. And God has really given us a pastoral heart and concern for our many workers that are going out uh, all over the Arab world. And we um, want to see emotionally and spiritually and physically healthy uh, workers on the field. And um, 
So member care is investing in all these global workers so that they can go to a team and thrive because we know that once you get into these more isolated places, all those dynamics and relationships and things can be challenging and even from a personal standpoint or from a team standpoint. So we really wanna make sure that uh, we have equipped our workers, our new workers, the best we can. Yeah. Not only that, once they're on the field, we want to stay in touch with them and support them in whatever way we possibly yeah. can. So um, member care has become something that's very important to us. And we believe that if you have spiritually strong and emotionally strong workers, then you're going to have stronger teams. And mm -hmm. if you have stronger teams, then you're going to have longevity. And that's really what yeah. we need in the Arab world to make a difference in the in the in the muslim population in the muslim world yeah uh, as scott mentioned um we, uh, lived at uh, outer world we have three launch teams um this is where uh, new missionaries they come and start their life in mission on one of these training teams uh, one we have in morocco one in egypt one in amman uh, just to encourage you um uh, we have sent um uh, 35 units and families uh, just from our launch team in Jordan. Uh, that's not, uh, you know, the launch team in Morocco or Egypt, just from one launch team. So you can add up numbers. Uh, we uh, launch out um, many missionaries and uh, we have missionaries in the other worlds in 15 countries that they start or they join a CP team, which is a church planting team. So they leave the launch team and they go and start or join a, um, a church planting team. So uh, we are so encouraged about um, that over 35 units, uh, units were sent out from Jordan. Uh, the one country that's not represented in, in the 16 Arab world countries right now is Libya. And we've had people there in the past, yes. but uh, politics and certain situations have dictated that uh, our workers cannot remain in the country. So right now we have no workers there. So you can pray that God will raise up more laborers and the doors will open again for us to send people into Libya. We have people really wanting to go, but the door the door kind of closed. So just pray that the door will open again. Yep. So uh, this morning, I really want to talk to you um, from the passage of Genesis 16, verses 1 through 13. And we're going to talk about uh, the the story of Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to read that together, uh, chapter 16 of Genesis, verses 1 through 13. And it says this, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant, and perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Uh, so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows that she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was, that, it was the, the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So she gave him this name to the Lord who spoke to her, and she said, you are the God who sees me. She says, I have now seen the one who sees me. So a lot going on in this little soap opera this morning. Uh, I want to focus in. Uh, I'm going to break up this passage into three different sections. 
And the first section is verses one through three. And this really is dealing with the dialogue between Abraham and Sarah. And as you know, uh, for these many years, Abraham has resisted following the accepted practices of the day. Um, he was following one God, right? Yahweh. And they were wealthy. They had many servants. Abraham could have easily had many wives, but he chose not to uh, in accordance with his faith. He chose to wait for the fulfillment of the promise to him and his barren wife. So at this point, though, Abraham is in his mid-80s, and Sarah decides that she wants to revert to plan B. How many like plan Bs, right? I like plan B. Problem is, sometimes we, we rely on them so much as a backup, we don't really trust God with plan A. And that's what we need to be careful about. So back in the day, in that culture, if a wife was unable to bear children, it was considered appropriate for the wife to give a servant to her husband as another wife. However, the understanding was that any baby that was born out of that situation would belong to the first wife. And that is why it wasn't unusual for Sarah to come up with the idea of, well, let's have Hagar have our first child together. It was very common and very normal. It doesn't sound that way to us in our modern culture, but back then it was very acceptable. But what happens is, is that in a moment of weakness, Abraham goes ahead and he agrees to the situation. But that's when things begin to unravel. Impatience and impulsiveness led to bigger problems. And how often are we disappointed in God because he doesn't show up in the way we think that he should show up? Sarah and Abraham had the same problem. And their flesh answer was to take control of the situation. And we all fall into that at some point in time in our lives, don't we? Sometimes we need to trust God with plan A. Plan Bs are good, but they really need to be down here and we need to stay focused on plan A and unless God really clearly directs us otherwise. Okay, so there if we go to verses four through six and we talk about Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Hagar gets pregnant. And then Sarah blames Abraham, and she wants Abraham to make it clear who's in authority. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. It's her idea. She's the one that pushes for it, and then she's not happy with it. And so who does she blame? It's all his fault. We're going to leave it at that. That can be a discussion question for your small groups. <clears throat> um, so Hagar gets pregnant. She blames Abraham. But then when all this transpires, uh, Hagar... Or, uh, Sarah becomes abusive towards Hagar, and Hagar runs away. There's family dysfunction, correct? So then we come to the last part of the story, and this is really where I want to hone in on our time together. Uh, and that's verses 5 through 13. There's three different things that I'd really like us to, to um, learn from Hagar in her situation. The first one is we need to stop looking at the physical circumstances and we need to embrace spiritual reality. Stop looking at the physical circumstances and embrace spiritual reality. The angel of the Lord appeared to her in verse 9. How many times in the Bible do we ever see an angel of the Lord appearing to a woman? Now we have the resurrection narratives and we have the birth narratives, right? But other than that, there's Samson's mom and... Um, there's some, I miss, oh, I said, well, I talked about the, the biblical narrative or the birth narrative. Um, well, and then the other one would be here with Hagar as being an Egyptian slave girl. She's a young girl. She's probably a teenager. She's Egyptian. She's not even Jewish. But yet, out of her misery and her isolation and her desperation, an angel of God sends an angel of the Lord to appear to Hagar. It's amazing. So what happens? Hagar's views of her situation changed when she realized that she may be physically banished, but she wasn't spiritually banished. She wasn't alone because God was with her and he saw her. And I know that some of you are going through really challenging situations and just realize that he's the God who sees you. He's not, he's not left you alone. He's not left you desolate. He has not left you abandoned to try to figure this all out on your own. It may feel that way sometimes, but his presence is with you. So don't give up. The second thing is obedience to the Lord is not always going to be easy. What's the first thing that the angel of the Lord tells her to do? He said, hey, now that you've we've had this interaction, 
you need to go back to Sarah. You need to go back and be under her authority. Well, that's not easy. She wasn't, she had been mistreated, but yet God's telling her to go back. Now that doesn't mean I'm uh, justifying or advocating for any kind of physical or emotional sexual abuse, that's kind of things. So that's a whole different ball game. I don't think that was the level that Sarah was mistreating Hagar here. And, but the bottom line is, is in our society, it's just so easy when we get offended to just quit, to change churches, to change jobs, to do this, to do that, just to avoid it. And we never really walk through the process of reconciliation yeah. or allow God to teach us through the hard things because we give up too fast and we go from plan A to plan B yeah. like that. Yeah. And so, you know, going, listening to God and being in difficult situations is part of the Christian walk. Mm -hmm. And I think that our culture today is weaning us away from that. And I don't think we realize how strong that pull really is. This wasn't an easy thing to do, but Hagar was able to do it because she knew that God was with her and that she had been seen by him. Hagar was blessed because of her obedience. And that's what God gave her the son Ishmael. And if you know anything about the background of history, the historical backgrounds of Christianity and, and Islam, this passage is where it all starts. Okay. Ishmael is, is the, is, they say, the Muslims say that it's uh, Abraham and Ishmael and the Christians say, no, it's uh, Abraham and Isaac. And so this is where all the problems started, but God still blessed Hagar and he, he gave her a son and out of that did come a nation. And it's all talked about here in, in Genesis chapter 16. Uh, want to share a story about a Muslim background believer uh, and uh, yeah. just talking about the whole situation about going back to hard situations. Many of our MBBs go through uh, very similar type stories. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, it's not easy to leave Islam and become a believer. That itself, it's it's a real commitment and sacrifice. Um, just to give you um, like stories from everyday life of a Muslim background believer, uh, especially when uh, they cannot leave their home and they stay home and uh, with relatives and family, like um, they're walking with the Lord and they're no longer Muslim. They love the Lord and they're in a situation where there is a family meal, especially during Ramadan. They have these uh, breaking fast together and our friend died. She was um, with her son, with her relatives, her aunt and her family, and uh, sitting at the table waiting for the call of prayer to eat. But usually, um, strict Muslim, they start, or most Muslim, they will start by praying together. So they all move out of the table and went and start praying. Our friend is like, I, I'm, I can't, I'm not, I'm not Muslim anymore. You know, so it she 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 felt like she was an awkward situation, but yet she wanted to continue loving the Lord, but not exposing herself because it's right now the situation it could be dangerous for her to be exposed. So she keep walking with the Lord, but she uh, limit she start to limit her um um you know, her visit and gathering with her relatives and uh, her family. So that's hard. She, it's kind of like isolation because if she's with them, she will be exposed. And then um, it, the situation can be really dangerous or risky. Uh, another uh, situation is like she want to grow in her faith and her relationship with the Lord to do one of the things to do that is to attend a church. Well, for her to go to a chair, she's exposing herself. So she, what she does is she knows that I need to go to church. I love her commitment. We both love how she is committed to the Lord. She wants to grow. She wants to grow, but she knows that, um, you know, she has to, uh, you know, to trust the Lord. And here she comes uh, 10 minutes late after the service start and leave before the service ends. So this way she doesn't put anybody in danger and she does not put herself in danger. And in the same time, she's growing in her relationship with the Lord. And because she's faithful, God opened an opportunity for her to serve at the church. So she does the translation from Arabic sermon 
and everything in Arabic, the worship, to English for our visitors. So there is, uh, in the back now, there is a, a closed room and um, she can see and hear what's going on in the service and be part of it, but she is in the back and nobody can see her. So she get, she got to be, she get to be there and do the translation and enjoy the service from beginning to end. So uh, obedient also, God will provide a way mm -hmm. out. I, and I feel like she feel that this is her way. This is God's way to honor her commitment. So, yeah. Yeah. And not only that, we are aware of other situations in That's other simple. countries, yeah. the other countries in the Arab world where um, the people are in prison for their faith, that they're refusing to recant uh, their love for Jesus. Yeah. And um, you can pray for them because uh, it's a very challenging situation but yet they're holding fast to their faith. And we need to trust that God's going to work all things together for the good. And among the these people that they are in prison, um, they're teenagers, like 16, 17, and they're committed to the Lord. Yeah. So going back to the passage, the first po point I had about Hagar was we need to stop looking at the physical circumstances and embrace the spiritual reality. The second one is obedience to the Lord it isn't always going to be easy, mm -hmm. even though we'd like it to be easy. Yeah. And then third, when your identity is in the Lord, you can face the most challenging of circumstances. Hagar's identity was not as the uh, banished, shamed, pregnant from another uh, woman's husband, slave girl. Her identity was reestablished in an all-encompassing love and acceptance of a loving father. So whatever challenges you're facing, whatever you wherever you might feel giving up maybe you're facing job situations where you're like i don't need this anymore i'll just go find another job or maybe it's a school situation where you know kids aren't kind to you or maybe it's uh something else uh, in the workplace or even in the church or even in your in a, a situation within your family um, god is with you he sees you and um if your identity is rested in him mm -hmm. he's going to see you through every difficult yeah. circumstance. Don't let go of Jesus. Yeah. Um, we'd like to share a couple more stories with you uh, in conclusion. Um, the first one has to do with my friend. His name's Robbie. He is a swim coach, very successful at what he does. Mm -hmm. And I met him, um, I don't know, five or six years ago. And uh, over a period of, well, first of all, when he was 15, he um, memorize the Quran. So he, in the, in the in Islamic world, that's huge. Yeah. And that's kind of puts him on a course for more spiritual leadership and mm -hmm. responsibility within the Muslim community. And, um, but what happened was, is as Robbie would study the Quran, the more he became disgruntled with it and became kind of disgusted with it and realized that he didn't like what he was reading and he didn't agree with what he was reading. However, like most young people in the Arab world that are getting disenchanted with Islam, they know that they can't, if they, the, the problem is, is if you convert to Christianity, you could lose everything and possibly your life. Yeah. But if you go agnostic or uh, atheist, mm -hmm. well, that's an insult, but it's not, it's not going to, you're not going to lose everything over it. Yeah. Okay. And so what a lot of people in the younger generations are doing right now in the Arab world and the Muslim world is that they're converting to atheism or agnosticism. And this is exactly what happened to Robbie. Mm -hmm. He decided that he would just go the agnostic route and see what happens. And as he studied that and got involved in that, uh, over a period of about 10 years, God was working on him and God brought specific people into his lives. And it, for one small window of that, I was one of those people as well. Uh, Deanna's siblings were a part of that because he was a swim coach for their kids. Um, it was just really neat to see how God used yeah. different pieces of the puzzle to minister to Robbie. And what happened was after about 10 years, he gave his life to Jesus. And also during that time, he was having uh, visions and dreams. Uh, he would have a reoccurring dream of being on a, a ship that was uh, in the midst of a huge storm, waves tossing, people falling overboard, screaming, shrieking, terrified, the whole bit. But yet he would be walking on the deck of the ship and he would see this door. And uh, when he got closer to the door, he would see this imprint of the face of Jesus. And he'd open the door and he would walk in and it was the total opposite. It was just peaceful, clear, still, quiet. 
and all the noise and everything shut out in the presence of Jesus. And he had that kind of a dream two or three times over a period of this, this 10 years. So well, um, about five years ago, uh, Robbie gave his life to Jesus. And when we returned from our last furlough, we were able to go be a part of his water baptism, which was really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a small group of people. It was done very quietly. And, you know, it's really a kind of sad, something that's supposed to be a public profession of your faith. Yeah. We still had to be very cautious about how we did it, where we met, how we met, mm -hmm. um, but yet we did it. And what was so powerful about that moment was that right before he was getting ready to go into the water, he just had, we had to stop the service because he was just so overcome with the emotion, um, with the seriousness of what he was doing. I mean, he was literally rejecting his family. He's rejecting his culture. He's rejecting the the religion of his childhood and his 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 whole, uh, you know, his whole culture, and so that's huge. And it just, I think it all just kind of came up on him and he just needed to time, uh, some time to process. And then he went, went through with the water baptism and he is flourishing. He's doing wonderful, um, loves the Lord, full of joy. He's so much fun to be around. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, um, the other thing is we've been able to utilize him with our field training. Uh, one time Deanna was going to be talking about reaching Muslims and she's like, I don't know why I'm doing this. She said, we should ask Robbie to come and, and do this for us. He'd do a great job. And after we, you know, uh, talked about it and got permission, uh, he came and did a phenomenal job. Our, our the people on our team just love him. And um, he's bold in his faith. He's using wisdom, but yet he's not holding back. He's He witnesses to all kinds of backgrounds. If you're anything that's not Muslim in the Muslim world is considered Christian. So he's talking to Orthodox and Catholic mm -hmm. and uh, you know, all kinds of people, but he does it in such a beautiful and discreet way. And matter of fact, he started a swimming, a swimming business called um, Living Waters. <laughs> and uh, all the Christians get it, but not, uh, Muslims would necessarily yeah. make that connection, but we do. And it's really, it's really fun to watch. So yeah. we're just really proud of him and continue to pray for that guy because he's, he's a person of influence and God's really blessing his life. And we're, we're better people because he's in our lives. Yeah. Um, the other story, actually, um, about our friend Yasmin, uh, you know, what the neat story about Yasmin, uh, she's Iraqi, lived in Jordan, um, that when she gave her life to the Lord, um, um, the first time when I met her, she, um, to disciple her, she told me that we need to pray that God will bring her family to the Lord. And that was her prayer. And I agreed with her and we start praying. And um, exactly one year of her being with the Lord, her sister who is vis who was visiting from Saudi Arabia uh, because she's married to a Saudi, uh, she noticed through the, the year that this means life is not the same and she is not the same person she's happier she's peaceful and uh, she has joy and um, her night terrors at night stopped and uh, a lot of changes and all of them that were good and i uh, start asking about what happened what the reason what did she do and this mean was sharing with her so when she came to visit in jordan she asked if we meet we met twice and then uh, before she head back to saudi arabia she asked if she um can meet uh, she can meet uh, again so they she and um Yasmin and her sister, she, they came over to our apartment in Jordan. And um, at that point, she still have a lot of questions. She still didn't give her life to the Lord, which understandable, but she has a lot of questions. And I felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart that this time I'm, I need to answer her from the word of God. So I told her, um, I'm going to go grab my Bible and I'm going to answer you from the word of God. And um, I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit to remind me the places uh, where, um, you know, uh, to, uh, to answer her questions. And after uh, she's done with all her questions, she said, I'm ready. I want to give my life to the Lord. And that day, exactly uh, a, a year after Yasmin gave her life, her sister and Sam 
gave her life to the Lord. Uh, and Sam, uh, she visited Jordan after that. And every time she come, will dedicate her kids um, to the Lord. So the last visit she was in Jordan, we dedicated her last uh, child uh, to the Lord, the youngest child. Uh, we met her husband. We prayed for him that God will change his heart. Um, but um, the story doesn't end there. And this is what need because it just keep going in a beautiful direction. Um, um, while she's in Saudi Arabia, uh, we got her connected with another girl from a Muslim background, but she lives in another part of the country. She lives on the uh, west side of the uh, Arabian Peninsula uh, on northern Mecca, a city in northern Mecca. And um, they took them some time to trust each other. And once they trust, um, she and I, like the three of us, will be talking to each other and uh, over the phone, praying and encouraging each other. And we start praying that these ladies uh, the sisters, they will meet in person. Um, and we want to trust the Lord uh, for that. So we prayed and trust him for that. Uh, then one day, um, um, and Sam, the sister, she called me to, and she, I could tell that she was upset. And she said that can, I call, I'm calling you to pray with me because my husband, he got us, um, a ticket to fly from Riyadh to Mecca to attend Umrah. Umrah, it's a mini Hajj, a mini pilgrimage, um, but a Muslim, they like to do it. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so she, she's, uh, she's been there before. She know what it is all about. And she told me this is a demonic and I have been there. I'm not going to go there. I, I need you to pray with me. And I was like listening to her and I felt the Holy Spirit said, told me to tell her, you know what? And Sam, you are going. And she's like, what are you saying? I called you so you can pray with me so I don't go. And I said, well, you are going. And she said, I'm going to go there and march around that thing seven times. I said, exactly. You're going to go and march around the wall of Jericho seven times. I said, how many? Christians, you are a Christian now. How many Christians, they are allowed to go there? Only people that they are Muslim. And you, on your ID, you are Muslim. So you can enter that place. You can enter Mecca. Me, I can't enter it. You know, from because I'm, you know, from Christian background, you are from a Muslim background. So you can go and you can pray. And God really touched her heart. And she said, I got it. I'm going to go and pray. And she did go and she did pray. And she said there was a lot of people there, a lot of kids, a lot of women, a lot of men. And she said, I just prayed and prayed. And one day we prayed together over the phone for all those people um, that, um, you know, are there. Uh, and, th and then we like we start praying that she will be able to go to see her friend uh, uh, to see Wafa, who lives literally 45 minutes northern Mecca. Um, the funny thing is she asked her husband to go, but her husband, he said no. But after they're done with the, the whole thing for that Umrah, he, he and his brother who went with him, they want to go smoke argile, which is like a hubbly bubbly um, uh, they're like bongs with the pipe on them, you see them. Yeah. They're very popular very in our part of the world. Yeah. And because Mecca is a holy city, they don't have this. So the closest uh, cafe that they have this thing is in Ta'if, where Wafa lives. And he told her, well, we change our mind. We'll drop you at your friend's house. And she go there and she give me a call. And I remember it was Friday evening and and when I answer, I heard her voice, she and Wafa together, and they were laughing and giggling. And they said, we have a church in Taif. And I said, hold on, what are you talking about? They said, we have a church in Taif. And I was like, I start shaking. I was like, wow, that is so powerful. And they said, isn't true that God said that Jesus said, if two or three gather, I am you know, I'm among them. They said, 
Uh, we're praying, we read the Bible, we worship, we had communion. And then, and Sam, she told me, do you remember, Diana, when I told you I really want to be baptized? And well, she said, I got baptized today in Wafa bathtub. She baptized me. So it is, <laughs> it's so neat that one Muslim MBB baptized another Muslim MBB. Isn't that the real deal the real church mm -hmm. uh, and it's 45 minutes northern mecca that is powerful god is faithful so those are just a, a, a few stories daily we are hearing stories from all over the arab world yeah. we have a feed that was within our company that we get little stories and testimonies on a really regular basis the lord is answering prayers we're seeing god bring more muslims to christ now in, in this time period of history than ever before. Yeah. So people's prayers are, are paying off. So we just yes. ask that you continue to pray for revival for the Arab world. Pray that God would send more laborers, especially young men. There's such such great opportunities for both single men, single men and women and families, but especially men because they can they because of the way the culture is they're able to get out and do more and travel more and yeah. you know do have more flexibility in their schedule and things like that so just pray that god would raise up more workers and especially more young men that would be huge um, we head back to jordan on may 30th to start our fifth term and uh, just want to say again, thank you for playing a part of that. Pray our transition back into the country goes well. Uh, it's always, you know, we're excited. Every, you know, we have our home there and the different things in place, but it's still an adjustment uh, yeah. spiritually, especially. Yeah. So just pray for, we just ask that you would pray God's covering and protection upon our hearts and our minds, especially our girls. Yeah. And uh, as we head back there, and uh, also our daughter, uh, youngest daughter, doesn't want to homeschool anymore. She would rather go to a private uh, school in Amman. And so just pray that God will work all those details out and that she would really transition well and be able to make some friends there. Uh, that would be just a really great situation for her. So other than that, we just uh, are grateful to you guys. They're grateful to Pastor Steve for the opportunity to share. Sorry we couldn't be there in person. This time, we usually always try to make it back in person, but this wasn't working this way or working that way with our schedule this time around. But maybe again, we'll see you again soon. So, uh, and hopefully you guys will send a team. Yeah. You want to no, say anything? no, we're just, um, you know, we'd love to see you in Jordan. So if God put it on your heart, you are more than welcome. Yeah. We love and appreciate you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much.